All right, folks, thanks for coming to watch the video today. Uh, we're in Tampa again. Um, this story's a bad one. I'm just going to let y'all know straight up, okay? Um, March the 18th, 2018, a mother and her daughter were um, killed by her boyfriend. Her son was left for dead, pretty much. And uh, like I say, this is, this, is, this is a graphic one. I'm going to give some of the details on this video. So uh, if you ain't down to hear all that, get out of here now. Don't watch it. Okay. Did I hurt you that night of this incident? Yes. I did. And how did I hurt you? He stabbed me. So these events took place March the 18th, 2018 on 13248 Pike Lake Drive in Tampa, Florida. Okay. I want to give a little bit of a pre-story to the actual day that the crimes happened. Okay. The people involved in this story are Ronnie O'Neill III, who at this time was 29 years old. Kenyatta Barron, who was 33. They had been together for quite a long time, okay, for several years, okay. They had two children together, uh, Ronnie O'Neill IV, who was eight years old, and Ronivia O'Neill, who was nine years old. Ronivia was born autistic, and she was nonverbal. Uh, she didn't speak. But she um, had, had trouble walking. She had to use leg braces in a wheelchair and things like that. So she needed a, she needed a lot of assistance. Um, having said that, let's not take away from the fact that that's a little child, okay? She's not special needs. She's somebody's baby. And um, sometimes in these cases, and in this one, I've already watched the video, I've seen it. They get really carried away with the fact that the kid is special needs. And they keep emphasizing that. This baby's name was Ron Nivia O'Neill. Okay, y'all don't forget that. Don't let her name, don't let this child get lost in this story, okay? Because so many times that happens. And this this is a human being. Ronnie had been shot in a drive-by shooting late 2017. Okay, the story we're telling here today was March of 2018. Ronnie's family would not let him come back uh, to live with them after he had been shot. Okay. It's important to know that Kiki was nice enough, Kenyatta was nice enough to let him move in with her and the children. Not in a relationship situation. It was very clear that wasn't going on. Ronnie already had another girlfriend and had a child with her at this time, okay? She wasn't he wasn't allowed to live with even them, okay? But while he healed up, he lived with Kiki, Ronnie the Fourth, his daughter. That's that's says a lot about Kiki, okay? She actually had already started going to school um, to a community college there in the area. And based on the photos and stuff, I've seen that the house, that house was full of love, okay? Ronnie came into that house. And I'm going to go ahead and start into the story now, okay, with what happened. Ronnie had adopted the Nation of Islam into his beliefs, and it, he was very convicted by it, I guess, based on uh, all of the all of the stories that you read. They were arguing quite a bit, Kiki and him, about Ronnie was trying to convince her to convert to Islam and make the kids do it also and adopt this. And she wasn't having it from, from what everything I've seen. And on the night of Mar uh, March the 18th, 2018, as little Ronnie testifies, that's actually what started the argument between them that night. Can you tell us what, what is the first thing you remember about that night? The first sign to you that something bad was going to happen? Um, basically, I was sitting in my room and I saw my mom and my dad arguing in their room. Were you awake or asleep? Awake when I saw. 
Okay, you were, did, but did something wake you up or were you already awake and, and doing something? Well, they're just like screaming at each other. Okay, so you heard uh, heard your mother, mother and father screaming at each other? Yes. You saw your mother and father arguing in the bedroom and your, and your father had a shotgun. What happened next? What did he do? My, my mom ran into my sister's room. My mom ran into my sister's room and turned uh, into the closet. And was your sister's room right next to yours? Yes. So your mother had to kind of run toward you? Yes. Did, and did you see that happen? See her run? Yes. Okay. And when your mother ran into your sister's room, what did your father do? Did he go after her? Yes. And did he have the shotgun with him? Yes. He chases her into Ronivia's bedroom and Kiki hides in the closet. Upon doing this, Ronnie the Fourth tells his son to walk around the house and chant Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allahu Akbar? Yes. And he told you to walk around and say that? Yes. And did you do that? Yes. And where where were you where were you doing this walking around and saying Allahu Akbar? It was like you would walk like at the front door, you would walk in, and then it was there, so like the living room. So they continue argue, arguing in the bedroom, and of course, you know, Ronivia is in the room watching all this happen. A shot is fired through the closet door, and it shoots, and he hits Ron, he hits Kiki. Okay, little Ronnie says he he had heard one gunshot prior to the events I'm fixing to say. Okay. His father hollers for him. And then my dad said, come in here and uh, come kill this, uh, the B word. And then I went in the room and then he handed me the shotgun and like helped me shoot it. So he goes in there with his dad and his mom and his mom is in the closet and his dad hands him a shotgun. And after listening to the transcripts and reading the transcripts, listening to the audio, what I can make of it is, is that his father actually kind of, I guess, huddles over him and grabs the gun while it's in his hands. And it's not clear if that's when she was shot or when she was shot through the door when he was in, in the living room chanting Allah Akbar. He doesn't really remember. He just knows he heard a gunshot go off. And the point is, is that she shot in the closet uh, during this whole situation, okay? So at this time, little Ronnie says he leaves the bedroom. He's standing in the end of the hallway by a table where the family's telephone was. And she comes running out of the closet down the hallway past him out the front door. Was there a time when your mother was able to get out of the closet? Uh, yes. I was sitting, or I was standing right by the, like, our house phone. And then I just saw her, like, she was, like, stumbling outside. And then I just saw my dad chase her. So your mother stumbled past you going outside. Did she go out the front door? Uh, yes. Can you tell us when she ran out the front door? If, if she was hurt. Were you able to see whether or not she was hurt? No, it was dark. Okay, was she saying anything? Uh, no, nothing that I remember. Was your father chasing her? Yes. Did he still have the shotgun with him when he chased her out of, out of the house? Yes. Was your father saying anything? Saying anything? Uh, uh, nothing that I remember. Okay, so when you're mother and father both leave the house what did you do then uh, I was still standing by the house room. has came outside with the shotgun after he's already shot her both kids are alive in the house at this time beats her with the shotgun to the point at which somebody made the comment the shotgun was disassembled and laid next to her body wasn't disassembled 
he beat it to pieces on her body. A neighbor witnessed it, okay? He um, then turns and goes inside. A few minutes later, he calls the police itself and says that the uh, Kenyatta is trying to kill him. Trying to throw smoke the other way, you know what I'm saying? And um, you look into this, you look into this case, you'll quickly find out that um, you're not going to have any remorse for old uh, Ronnie there. And if you find remorse, please message me and let me know where you found it because uh, I can't find it. After he hangs up with making his own 911 call, little Ronnie describes to the police in emotion. He actually showed them after this was all over how what your father did to your to your sister and he stood up and used an axe motion like using an axe to come down come to find out Ronnie the third used a tomahawk style axe on his daughter and chopped her in the head and the description was head neck torso I don't know if it was multiple hits or not but I know when Ronnie showed what he was doing he showed multiple hits he hit her in the back of the axe and then the, in the head and then there was blood everywhere and then he lighted something he lighted something with the tissue and the match he lighted then, something with the tissue and a match yes ronnie actually had a gas can and he had spread gas all over kiki's bedroom do you remember um you remember your father ever having a can of gasoline yes he like spread it everywhere and then he got the match and, uh, and then he dropped it on the ground and then it like all the fire up here he lights a match and lights a piece of tissue and throws it in the floor where ronivia is laying he then takes little ronnie and gets him on the ground and standing on him, putting his, put, got his foot on his back, and is trying to light a match to put on him. Ronnie, little Ronnie, ends up running into the kitchen, and his dad comes after him, opens up a kitchen drawer, pulls out a knife, and starts stabbing him and cutting him. Okay. We do know this. Police arrive at the scene. Kenyatta's laying in the front yard, motionless, dead. And at this exact time, Ronnie comes walking out of the garage and there's flames behind him. The house is now on fire. And the cops are telling him to stop. You know, he, he uh, he's not listening to anything, okay? They tase him. In the, midst of, in the midst of them tasing him, he's shouting, Allah Akbar, and keeps on shouting it until they get him in the car and everything else. At the same time, Little Ronnie the third comes walking out of the garage, flames behind him. 30% of his body is burned, okay? He has stab wounds in his face, neck, abdomen, chest, and arms. He goes to the cops and he tells the cops that my daddy killed my mommy. When he came walking out of the house, it was the first thing that the detectives said they saw was his abdomen had a very large wound. Uh, where he was cut, but he sustained cuts to, like I say, his face, neck, extremities were cut up really bad, and um, of course he was 30% burned over his whole body, and uh, one, one, one article I read said that he looked like a ghost, because behind him there was all the flames in the garage, and he was walking in front of it, and uh, the detectives got him, and gave him, you know, got him to Got him to some aid pretty quick, you know. So that's about the end of this story. Ronnie chose to uh, be his own lawyer in this case. He didn't do himself any favors. I am not sorry. for something I didn't do 
and I am not sorry for the things I did do. Evidence is going to show. That we are under some of the most vicious lying <clears throat> fabricating. Nineteen years I've been at this job. I've seen human beings killed at the hands of others in every way imaginable. You name it, I've seen it. Shooting, stabbings, drownings, suffocates, blown apart by uh, cars, some DUI manslaughter cases. Horrible things. This is the worst case I have ever seen as far as the facts go. Because there is no way any person with any feeling could have witnessed or seen the photos of what occurred that night and not be haunted for the rest of your life. Mm. I noticed that the um, Renivia's bedroom, before you set it on fire, you could tell she tried so hard to make her feel like a princess. Mm. She did, Kenyatta did everything she could. And mm. I noticed too in the kitchen on the refrigerator, she put up magnets that said faith, love, family, Hope. And then you know what else happened at the refrigerator during that night? It got splattered with blood all over it due to what happened. And little Ronivia, she couldn't scream. She couldn't run away. And she witnessed what you did to her mother for shooting her mother in the arm with the gunshot. She knew. And the horror that that child suffered. And she already had a life where she was born with challenges mm. regarding her physical and her mental disabilities. Mm. But the pain and suffering that she suffered that night at your hands, mm. unspeakable, absolutely unspeakable. Mm. He ended up receiving three life sentences with 90 years tacked onto the end of that. So, all right, so we're here at uh, Rest, Haven, Rest Haven Memorial Park in Tampa, huge cemetery, 40 acres. I had to get help to find the graves. Um, thanks Jim and the staff back at the office. So I'm gonna take y'all to the grave now and show y'all. So right where the Mickey Mouse is right there, that's where little Renivia is buried, right here. And then right to her left, or her right, I'm sorry, where the little Santa Claus thing is, which is what I brought. Right here is where Kenyatta is buried. So it's just a couple days past Christmas here. And I wanted to bring a couple gifts. One to a beautiful little girl. And one to her beautiful mama. So Ronivia and Kiki, Merry Christmas. Definitely sending prayers for y'all. I'll show y'all what I got them. This little Santa Claus ornament for her. And that little Minnie Mouse for her. And uh, like I said, Merry Christmas. Praying for y'all. And just know you got a lot of family that loves y'all still. They're praying, I'm praying. Y'all rest in peace. And that'll be the end of this video. Y'all take care. Like, share, and subscribe to my page. Sorry I'm having to talk so low. People are all around. And uh, y'all like my page, please. It helps me out a ton. Subscribe to me. More content like this coming. We've got a lot of stuff planned on this trip right here. I've already got about seven videos planned along with this one right here. So thank you for y'all's time. And uh, we'll see y'all next time.